the negative portion of the movement, okay, is what's going to cause that micro tearing of the muscle fibers. So the whole movement together builds strength and muscle. I do see a lot of people who get stronger, but they don't get bigger. And that's because they don't control the negative. So you see these guys on the bench where they're kind of pushing the weight up. So they're building strength and then there's letting it fall on their chest with gravity. That's not doing any, that's not giving you any benefits in terms of building muscle. created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Television, rxmuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, your 30 minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. Be it bodybuilding, non bodybuilding, we got you. Diet, training, supplementation, it is all on the table. We're going to go right into the questions. The first two questions on this show from the Dave Palumbo experience happened. This first question, I kind of wish he added a little bit more context, a little bit more perspective. He just goes, What can I do to stop snoring? <laughs> If we only knew the answer to that question, we would be uh, rich men. You know, uh, I don't snore when I'm under 200 pounds. I, if I would have told you that, if I would have had this conversation with you about seven, t seven to 10 years ago, I would have said, I don't snore when I'm under 250 or 235. For some reason, I, I went down really low, obviously, when I had all my little surgeries. And when I regain my weight and I'm back up over 200 now, I seem to be snoring if I'm laying straight back. If I'm on my side, I don't snore. So what, what I recommend you do is get it, one of these chiropractic pillows. They they like kind of like car, it's like a it's a pillow that's kind of stiff on the sides, and it kind of has like a little carved out area for your head and your neck, and there's like a little neck support behind it. So you when you're laying straight back, your kind of head is supported from side to side and back to front. And then if you go move on your side, the pillow's higher when you turn to your side because you're supposed to, your head is supposed to be up higher when you're on your side, otherwise your head would fall down. You know. And ever since I've been using one of those pillows, I get the best night's sleep. I never have neck pain. And when I turn, if I do snore on my back, I just, all I have to do is turn onto my side and it goes away and it stops. So that's probably the easiest thing. Now, some people have what's called sleep apnea where they actually, <clears throat> they can't breathe. They stop breathing when they're doing that. And if, if turning on your side doesn't help because maybe you're, you're, you know, you're, you're heavier and it's just not doing the trick, you might want to get one of those masks Sometimes they have the, they have the ones that the nose cannula just goes right up your nose. It's like a, a CPAP machine, so it's continuous airflow. It's pushing air into your lungs so that you can breathe, so you don't get that like gaspiness. And a lot of times that can solve the problem. Some people don't like it; doesn't work for them. Uh, I've seen people get you know their tonsils removed, their adenoids removed, or their throats enlarged. A lot of times that just doesn't help, and it has a lot to do with the thickness of your neck and how much fluid you're retaining, but. My first line of defense would be get the chiropractic pillow. Everyone should have one of those anyway. You can buy them online. You can get them on um, Amazon has them, but there's some specific sites. Sometimes you, I bought mine from my chiropractor originally, and they work really well. And I, I would try that first. If that doesn't work, you know, you can try the, uh, the, the you can go for maybe a sleep study. See if you do have, because if you have sleep apnea, you should, you should sleep with one of those masks. A lot of times those snoring is just due to body weight, a body weight situation. 
Second question, again, these questions are from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, is DECA actually worth adding to a 250 mg per week test base? In what way does it actually help in terms of muscle building? Is there a specific way they interact together that makes it a bit more effective for muscle build uh, for building lean muscle? I watch your videos on DECA, but looking for more of a recent conclusion from you. Yeah, you know, um, I'm back on like 100 milligrams per week of testosterone. And, you know, it, it, this might be worth even making a little segue here because if, if I don't know if you guys watched the latest guru talk with Dominic Mutasio and Dr. Pierce, and we talked about, you know, I was, I was kind of like a little confused, not really confused, but I noticed that when I take 100 milligrams per week of testosterone replacement, I usually do 50 milligrams twice a week, my total testosterone has consistently been 1250 total. That's high. That's high for 100 million. I know guys that take 400 milligrams per week and can't even get up to 800. So, you know, we were kind of throwing this back and forth. And, and Dr. Pierce seems to think, and I, I tend to agree with him, that certain people can use testosterone better than others. So that's probably why I, you know, I respond really well when I take anabolics because I utilize the anabolics better than other people do. And, and, and you know, that's an important you know, point to make. Now, at some one point when I got my ankle fused and I was in a lot of pain, you know, inflammatory wise, you know, I, I got a prescription and I was, and I added a hundred mil to the hundred milligrams of testosterone I was taking. I actually added a hundred milligrams of DECA per week, only a hundred milligrams. And the anti-inflammation effect of DECA is great. But what I noticed was I had a re, just a hundred of two different compounds. I was stacking essentially, even though I was stacking physiological dosages, I noticed that my muscle gains improved significantly. Not like one plus one equals two. It was like, holy shit, why am I so strong? Well, holy, holy mackerel, why am I putting on muscle this fast? And I think it's because when you, when you, when we know that when you stack two compounds, the other testosterone with another anabolic or two anabolics, you get, you get a synergistic effect from it. So, you know, if you're going to use 200 milligrams of DECA with 200 milligrams of testosterone, you're probably going to see some good results from it. You know, you're not going to see the results of that if you were taking 1,000 milligrams of test with 400 milligrams of DECA, but you're going to see significant in improvement over just being on HRT. And, I, and at that point, you're really not on HRT. You're kind of doing like a mini cycle, even though your dosages are low and the toxicity is, is negligible. But you're going to see that benefit because you're putting two different compounds together. And that's what I've observed. And once again, how much you I always get this question, how much muscle can I gain? Well, just like I explained before, some people utilize testosterone better. Some people utilize all anabolics better. You know, look at Kevin Lavroni. So it's impossible to predict how much muscle you will put on from a given 200 milligram dose of those two combined because I might respond better than you do. And so it's, it's, it's impossible to know what that might be. But let's keep a positive outlook and assume that, you know, the better you eat, the better you train, the more rest you get, the better your results are going to be. Let's go to our Facebook and Instagram questions on Facebook. Just search for RX Muscle. You can ask your questions in our weekly thread for Ask Dave questions. Same on Instagram, but the handle is official underscore RX Muscle. Let's go to Damien Deline. If you're looking to lose a bunch of weight and you work out early in the morning, would it be better to train fasted with, quote, some food or a regular meal last? Would it be beneficial to do your cardio first in this instance, currently only taking lipolyze? Goal is to maintain muscle, but mainly lose fat, like a lot of fat. Yeah, yeah, I think this is, I get this question a lot. I was just talking to one of my clients today about this, and because she likes to, you know, she goes to the gym in the morning, and she doesn't want to run out of meals, so she's doing her weights and then her cardio, and then going home and eating. And I'm like, you can't, you can't work out on an empty stomach. It's not a good idea. You, for men, you'll probably lose muscle. Women probably won't lose muscle. But what it does is it, it, it's telling your body to conserve energy because there's no food there. You know, you just woke up from eight out, eight, at least eight hours of not eating probably. And now you're going to the gym and asking the body, demanding that it, that it produce glucose and, and engage in you know, physical activity without any energy being put into the system. So it's, it's going to use potentially you know, lean muscle tissue and turn that into glucose uh, because you don't have anything in your system and it's going to probably shut your metabolism down because it's going to say, wait, we got to conserve energy here. This, this person's not feeding us and is demanding that we do a lot of exercise here. So while doing low intensity cardio, which burns exclusively stored body fat is okay to do first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. It's not okay to weight train, which is a high intensity activity that requires carbohydrates or at least 
or at least some protein in your system that's going to be turned into some carbohydrates, you know? So my recommendation is if you're going to go to the gym in the morning and you're going to do your weight training and your cardio, eat something first or have a shake, go to the gym, train with weights, and then after the weights are over, you'll kind of be in a depleted state at that point because you've depleted what you just ate, and then do your cardio. If you don't want to do weights first thing in the morning, you can do cardio first thing in the morning, and that can be done in an empty stomach. Then you can come back and you can eat your meal and uh, you know whenever you're going to do your weights. But you should never weight train on an empty stomach. It's not a good idea. If it has to happen once in a blue moon because you, you're waking up at 4 in the morning because you have to do something early, different story. But try to always get either a meal or shake and before you weight train. Whereas cardio can be done in an empty stomach, especially if you're doing you know steady state cardio. High intensity cardio should not be done in an empty stomach. You shouldn't even be doing high intensity cardio in reality because there's no reason to because it doesn't burn fat. It burns it burns uh, carbohydrates exclusively as a fuel source. Now that might it might be an afterburn metabolically speaking, but if you're looking to mobilize stored body fat, steady state lower intensity cardio is better. Let's go to uh, Kayvon Sutter. Nia, I'd like to thank you and you know, for everything that you guys do. Uh, what are your thoughts on emphasizing the stretch and the negative part of a rep as being more productive than the positive portion for maximum hypertroph hypertrophy? You know, theoretically, that's a correct statement, but practically it's not because imagine you just did negatives. Like you got on a bench and you got 405 and you just controlled the way down and then your training partner lifted it up to you and then you controlled the way down. Theoretically, you should just grow because right the, the growth is, is gotten from the negative portion of the movement. As you're, in other words, you're resisting the mus the muscles are in a contracted state and you're resisting and they're tearing apart, right? But it doesn't happen like that. So the whole movement is necessary. So what I tell people to do is can always control the negative, explode through the, the positive portion of the movement. So you want to push as much weight as you can because that's going to develop strength and 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 um, ligament and and uh, tendon strength. But the negative portion of the movement okay, is what's going to cause that micro tearing of the muscle fibers. So the whole movement together builds strength and muscle. I do see a lot of people who get stronger, but they don't get bigger. And that's because they don't control the negative. So you see these guys on the bench where they're kind of pushing the weight up. So they're building strength and then there's letting it fall on their chest with gravity. That's not doing any, that's not giving you any benefits in terms of building muscle. So, you know, when I would do bench pressing, you know, whether it be flat bench or incline bench back in the day, dumbbells, I would always have people running over to try to help me because I was so slow and deliberate, especially the heavier the weight. I would bring it down on the control. I'd pause. I'd squeeze it up. And, and with a lot of weight, a lot of people think would think I was stuck. And I'd be like, don't touch the weight. <laughs> don't, don't touch the weight because that's how deliberate I was. But, and that's how you, but that's how you build muscle because you're controlling the movement. If you're using momentum or using gravity or bouncing things off the ch your chest or bouncing off the bottom of the movement on squats – you're not getting the most benefit out of it. But yes, the negative portion of the movement is really the part that's responsible for building size, whereas the positive portion of the movement is really what's responsible for building strength. Um, Gringles Fauci with Connor, uh, interesting name. Your thoughts on the re Tony Huge documentary where he openly, or he is openly discussing and promoting gear uh specifically his methodology of constantly injecting the young competitor that is featured in the show with more and more stuff so openly in front of everyone do you think the documentary is good for the sport and your overall impression or takeaway so i don't know if you've got an opportunity to yeah. see this uh documentary i have not seen it so it, uh, it would be i'd be talking out my butt if i really commented on it however I don't, I don't think the message is good. I know what Tony's trying to do. He's trying to promote himself and his business. And sensationalism sells, of course. So from a marketing standpoint, I think he's, what he's doing is, is probably smart. From a advice and from a good information um, thing, probably not the best message he's sending. I mean, look at um, – I can't wait till the Boston Lloyd documentary is on Amazon. It's out now, but it's not on Amazon. And, you know, Boston's a perfect example of someone who – really wanted to help people, but like to tell people about the crazy stuff that he did. And unfortunately, people didn't listen to the message, which was don't listen to me. Here's the right way to do it. But this is how I do it. And instead, they listened. A lot of kids listened to what he did. And so it gave the wrong message while he was like trying to be genuine and say, you know, I'm, I'm transparent. This is what I do. I don't want to lie to you, but you shouldn't do this. No one listened to him on that. So it, it actually was a bad thing 
the information he was putting forth. And I think that's what his mom was trying to put out with the documentary. Like, don't, don't do what my son did. You know, I'm not saying bodybuilding is a bad thing, but you shouldn't do what my son did because look, it, it ultimately caused his death. And I think that's what Tony is doing. He's, he's sending a bad message. If he's showing, you know, injecting young guys and stuff like that, what he should be doing is, you know, what, what I try to do at least, because look, there's no way to look good giving information on steroids, but I'd rather give, you know, information that's smart and that's not destructive and that at least encompasses health checks and doing things the right way and you know not doing taking unnecessary risks then then not put out good information but when you start to sensationalize that aspect of our sport it's already kind of on in a gray area on the line i think that that could border on you know irresponsible i haven't seen the documentary so i it would be i don't really want to make too much of a comment on that Let's go to, um, there was a question about liver enzymes from Sinslescu Razvan. Uh, general about keeping your enzyme, your liver enzymes low. What is the best way? I tried injectable uh, Hepamert, uh, NACL, ornithine, liver protect pills, you name it. Uh, though TGP remains at 50 to 90. Yeah, um, I just talked about this the other day on After Hours, actually. Liver enzymes are a terrible terrible term to call these SGOT, SGPT, all these enzymes that they measure on blood work. It's not a good term. It's, it's very misleading. And I'll tell you why. Because these enzymes, they're metabolic enzymes, meaning they're enzymes that you know initiate metabolism in the cells. They're in all our cells. Now, for the average person who doesn't work out, okay, if you check these enzymes and they're high, more than likely they came from the liver because no one's breaking down muscle tissue. The problem is th there's, these enzymes are found in very high amounts in muscle tissue. So if you're a bodybuilder and you go into the gym five, six days a week and you're breaking down an enormous amount of muscle tissue, you're going to leak these enzymes from the damaged muscle into the bloodstream, which is going to give the impression that you have the liver damage. Because in other words, if these, these are also found in the liver and they're high in the bloodstream, then that can mean that your liver has been damaged. And so, especially in a bodybuilder who's using steroids, what is the most, what do most of these doctors think? Oh, you have liver damage, but they're not specific to liver. They're specific to muscle too. And I noticed when I was, you know, lifting lighter, you know, when I first came back from, you know, my, all well, my surgeries, my liver enzymes were normal and they had never been normal my whole life. Okay. Every time I, you know, from being an endurance athlete to bodybuilding naturally to bodybuilding on stuff, the liver enzymes, as I got bigger, the enzyme levels went higher, which makes sense because the more muscle you have and the more muscle you break down, the higher, more enzyme you can leak. As you get smaller and you have less muscle mass in your body, you won't raise your enzymes as high. So when a doctor says these enzymes can only come from liver, he's, it's, it's like it's backwards. It, they, can, they can't come from liver. They can only come from muscle because only muscle has enough volume in your whole body to create that much enzyme to raise your enzyme levels two, three four times normal. And so it's not a real good measure or metric, as we say, for, for damage. It's a, well, it's a good metric for damage. It's not a good, it's a good, not a good metric for liver damage because they're coming from muscle. And, and really, I mean, I could tell you to take two weeks off from the gym and you still might not have completely normal levels because your body's constantly in a state of breakdown. You know, if you don't, you know, a lot of people think if you don't work out at all for like six weeks, your body starts breaking down muscle tissue because you don't, you're not using it. And, and that will leak the enzyme into the, into the muscle too. So not training is as bad as, as train as training. So it's almost like you have to lower your intensity of training for, for a period of time. So you maintain your muscle and you don't break it down, but you don't raise those enzyme levels too high, but it's, it, it's not a good, they got to come up with a better measure of liver. If you want to test yourself out, you know, and you, and you're worried, you could always go for a liver sonogram and that's going to give you like a read on whether there's any damage or any cirrhosis or any kind of, you know, fibrotic tissue in your liver or if you have fatty liver infiltrate or anything like that. So that's a better way to do it if you're really worried. But for most young guys and for most people, when I see high liver enzymes, I, I just look past it. It doesn't even doesn't even phase me. I'm not even like concerned at all about it, to be honest with you. Let's go to NY Bigger. When on TRT for health reasons only, is there any benefit to taking a big uh, a break of eight weeks or so to allow your receptors to reset? Will your TRT regimen benefits from such benefit from such a break? I know it's important for bodybuilders, but wondering if it's important for people on low dose TRT, uh, like under two hundred, whatever. Can there be any adverse effect by taking such a break? 
You know, it's a good question. And a lot of people don't feel a need to because they're not really, if they're on TRT, they know they're really not, they're not going to put on massive amounts of muscle anyway. They're just going to feel good and maybe they're going to hit a certain point and maintain that muscle mass. You know, it wouldn't hurt probably once a year to take a four week break because for the first two to three weeks, you're going to, you're going to still have testosterone in your system just because the, the, the long acting esters last that long. So, you know, it might be not be a bad idea to take a month off, you know, once, once a year, just to see how you feel, maybe regenerate some of the receptors a little bit. You might get a little bump in, in progress, but is it necessary? No, because there's no toxicity to a shot of testosterone every week. Uh, and I don't think you're really shutting down your receptors that much on a, on, on a physiological dose of every, every, you know, every week. I just don't think you're raising your levels enough where the androgen receptors would say, Hey, we got to downregulate because there's too much testosterone stimulating the body here. So that's why I don't recommend it. Now, I have people who do cycles and then they want to go right from the cycle to TRT levels. That might not be the smart. I, I think in that case, I'd rather see you do a PCT four weeks off and then, or, or at least do a PCT for four weeks and then go on to HRT just to give your body a break. But I, if you're doing TRT all the time, I don't think there's a need to go on a break at all, unless like you wanted to get you know your wife pregnant or something like that. Let's go to Mike Molinaro. When I count macros and weigh my food out, am I counting the macros of the food after it's cooked? For example, eight ounces of chicken, let's say that's 35 grams of protein. I weigh it out eight ounces after it's cooked, right? Same with rice. Yeah. Well, let's not confuse. Let's, 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 this, now this is a little mathematics uh, lesson here. If you're eating, if I'm telling you to eat eight ounces of chicken, you, you want to measure it and weigh it. Okay after it's cooked, okay? Because that's what you're actually going to be putting into your mouth. You're not eating the raw chicken, you're eating the, the cooked chicken. So I want you to eat eight ounces, that's 50 grams of protein or 55 grams right around there. That's great. Rice is not done by weight, okay? Not at least cooked stuff. So with, with rice, let's say you have a box of rice, okay? And you look on the box and it says um, uh, half a cup uncooked of this minute rice yields 37 grams of protein, which let's say I need about 40 grams, of, excuse me, at least 37 grams of carbs. Let's say you're looking for about 40 grams of carbs or 35 grams of carbs. All right, that's perfect. So you take a half a cup uncooked, you put it into a bowl, you add water to it, and then you cook it. Now that might blow up to a whole cup, right? But you're not at that point, you already know whatever you put into that bowl is 35 grams of, or 37 grams of carbs. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how much water you add to it and how much it, it gains in weight because it absorbs that water it's still 37 grams of carbs because it's, 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 the, it's the starchy content in the rice that you're, you're going to be eating. So for that, you, you don't have to weigh it again after you cook it because you're, you're pre-weighing it based on what the serving size is according to the box. Now, with a baked potato or like a sweet potato, like a baked potato is about 4.5 grams of carbs per ounce. So let's say you eat 10 ounces of baked potato, okay? That's going to yield 45 grams of carbs. That you would weigh after you cook it because sometimes you can lose a little weight uh, uh, when you're cooking something like that because sometimes some of the potato falls off in, in the water and stuff like that if you're boiling it or something like that. So I would weigh potatoes. They probably weigh almost exactly the same pre-cooking and post-cooking. But if you want, I would just weigh the potato uh, after. But with rice, it's easy because the box tells you how to measure it. So I hope that clarifies it. It's like, you know, you, it, it sounds confusing, but it's really pretty easy if you think about it. Question on keto from uh, James Walters. Ketogenic diets and LDL cholesterol, especially for lean, massive hyper responders, impact, if any, on cardiovascular health, inflammation markers such as CRP being almost zero due to avoidance of sugar, sugar alcohols, and rancid oils. LDL particular size distribution versus absolute LDL cholesterol importance. Yeah, I, I can simplify this very simply. <laughs> If you get your blood work, like I just got my blood work done recently, and I was talking about this on also on after hours, I got a TRT clinic one in my blood work, and and uh, my endocrinologist wanted blood work. They both ordered at the same time. I went into lab court. They were they they pulled my blood and they filled both orders. Okay, at the exact same time, blood work came back. The values are not the same. <laughs> they're not dramatically different, but they're but they're significantly different. That some of them were high and some of them were in the normal range, and they were just different values. And they were pulled exactly at the same time from my body. 
What does that mean? <laughs> it means that the blood work is a, it's an estimate. You know, it's not it's not exact an exact number. All right, so you you have to remember that right off the bat that when you get your blood work done, it's not an exact measure. Now, what, what was <laughs> I'm I confused myself. What was what was the question again, Sid? It's kind of a long. No, what was uh, it, what were they what would they wanted me to comment on? That's what I was trying to figure out my, myself. I mean, it was like okay, kind of messes ketogenic diets and LDL cholesterol, especially. Oh yeah, I, I remember. Yeah. I, I remember. So now, if your LDL cholesterol is high, okay. If it's high, you have to ask yourself a question. All right, my CRP or C-reactive protein is normal. My triglycerides are normal. I've gone for a cardiac CT scan and it's normal. I don't have, I have zero calcium, you know, or any kind of buildup. Why is my LDL high? Well, what you should do is you should ask your doctor to test for particle size, okay? Because the particle size of the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, is important. If you have small particle size, that's dangerous. And, the re and I can give you a little analogy that uh, Dr. Pierce used. Imagine like your blood vessel wall has these little pores in it and little tiny LDL cholesterol pieces can get caught in the wall and start building up plaques. Whereas if you have large particle size for your LDL cholesterol, those big pieces can't get caught in the, in the blood vessel walls and cause blockages. So you could have high LDL and not have it be dangerous to your heart because you have big particle size. You only have to worry if you have high LDL and small particle size. So now they're doing these tests regularly. You can ask your doctor to, to, to request what size particles you have on your LDL cholesterol, and they'll tell you. And, that, and that, that's, a, that's a big difference. And that's why I've seen guys with very high LDL because it genetically runs in their family, but they have no blockages. And, and it's because their LDL is big particle size, it's not small particle size. So, so it adds another little twist and nuance to the – uh, cholesterol equation, it's not always just LDL cholesterol that dictates whether you're going to get blockages in your arteries or not. It's the particle size of the LDL that's important. Uh, Alan Minch, how long does it take uh, DECA to induce joint pain relief? I know you've said even on a low weekly dose of 50 to 100 mg yields, this uh, mg yields these results. Does a higher dose of say 300 mg a week yield faster or better results mm -hmm. in the area? My my experimentation with this is, you know, when I would do DECA back in the day, I would do like four or 500 milligrams a week, and I always got really good joint relief. When I did that little test recently after I had my ankle fusion, I did six weeks of DECA, uh, I used 100 milligrams. And you know what? I, after about, a, about two weeks, I noticed results, which is consistent because DECA takes about two weeks to get into the system, you know, in, in good enough dose. And I got the same joint relief I found with 100 milligrams per week that I got with with five or 600 milligrams per week. So the anti-inflammation effect is at a much lower dose, whereas the muscle building effect would obviously be, you know, a higher dose is going to give you some better results. So I think 100 milligrams is probably adequate for anti-inflammation. And I would I would guess that the the onset of action is, is probably still two weeks, whether you're doing a higher dose or a lower dose. It doesn't matter because the DECA is just a long acting ester. It takes a little time to build up in your system. Uh, let's go to Travis James. What solutions options do you suggest when adding a fiber supplement such as Fiberlize and others? It's not resolving constipation, assuming adequate hydration and water intake. You got to remember when you a lot of people don't start a, a fiber supplement like Fiberlize until they're backed up. So once you, it's like it's like trying to like uh, all right, you know what? You got a clogged drain in your house, and you're gonna like start, you know, you're gonna stop putting all the bad stuff down the down the drain that that clogged it. Well, guess what? You know, it, it, it's might not fix the problem. Also, you might pour some Drano down there, and the Drano might not be able to get to the the clog because you got so much in there. You might have to get a plumber there to first loosen up all that stuff and get it out of there. So, you know, it might take two three weeks for the fiber to really start working. You might sometimes have to take some sort of like a Senna product, which is kind of like a laxative. Uh, it'll kind of make you poop a lot. You might have to do that one time to get yourself cleaned out if, if the fiber can't do the job. And then once you get cleaned out, if you stay on fiber lice twice a day, you'll never get backed up again. The key is to prevent it from happening before it happens, because once it happens, it's hard sometimes to go. But for most people, if they get a little backed up and they use fiber, in a couple days, in a day or two, they usually go to the bathroom, no problem. I, I, I've noticed that. But there are people that are severely, and it gets like almost like cement in there. 
and they they need a little help sometimes. Look, I've seen people that had to go to the hospital because they were so they were they had a blockage literally they created for themselves. You see it a lot too with the use of like these GLP one agonists like Ozempic or Monjaro. Uh, semiglutide is another is the generic name of Ozempic. Though you know they slow your digestive tract down. So if you don't use like fiberlize with when you're on Ozempic or Monjaro, you're absolutely going to get constipated because. It's already doing. It's already slowing you down, and the longer the food stays in your colon, the more water the colon pulls out, and it starts turning hard and cement-like. And then it won't. You won't. You'll be backed up forever. So, if you're going to use any of these uh, GLP-1 agonists, make sure you're definitely on fibrolyzed twice a day. Let's go to a big ant ten twenty six. When you were at your best, when you competed, did you eat? A lot of lean white fish seems as if today a lot of competitors, uh, not enough competitors rather, are eating lean white fish these days in their prep. Yeah, when I would prep, I ate a lot of fish. Uh, I did. I, I liked it. And you know what? When you're starving, like fluke, flounder, cod has the most exquisite taste. <laughs> I can't explain. Your taste buds become so fine tuned when you're hungry. I think your body does that purposely because. It, it, it's like starving for nutrition, and so it makes everything taste better because it, obviously, if things taste good, you're gonna you're gonna be more likely to eat. It doesn't know that you're purposely kind of starving. It's you know, so uh, I would eat, yeah, I would eat like flounder. Fl I never, I never ate tilapia, you know, and I because I always was like suspicious of it because it was a it was a farm raised fish, and I knew that they had some toxicity issues with it. Even back when I was competing, uh, a lot of guys did use tilapia. You know, people use tilapia because it's cheap and because it tastes good. It really has a, it almost tastes like chicken. And that's probably because they feed it the same thing that they feed chickens. <laughs> the wild caught fish is much better. You know, um, any kind of white fish is usually pretty good. Flaky white fish. Uh, I find that you lose weight better on eating that than even eating chicken breast or eating, you know, red meat. You just, I, it makes your insulin receptors more receptive. You produce less insulin, thus you lose, you know, you tend to burn fat better. And, you know, we do that a lot with competitors the last four to six weeks that if they have to really thin out their skin and they're just not dropping enough body fat, I'll switch a lot of guys or women to all fish and it, and it definitely works better. Luckily, you know, most people do like fish. There are some people that don't like fish. And I always tell my competitors, look, if you don't like fish, just tell me, I don't, you don't have to eat it. You know, I don't want anyone eating something that they can't stomach, but if you can do it, it's a good idea. Let's go to sway me down. Uh, I know we've talked a, a lot about coming off cycle to let your receptors take a break, but we never talked about time frames. How often should we go fully off for receptor recovery versus time on? You know, it's the answer is going to be different for different groups of people. Like there are guys that like have, you know, a six month off season, then they go into like a, a five month prep. Okay. And then they compete two or three shows. And then I take, and then I'll clean them out for like eight to 10 weeks. And that's their whole year cycle, you know, pretty much. So they're coming off once a year. They're doing a big off season, going into contest prep and then off. For people who are not like necessarily going to do a show, I would break that into two or three mini cycles. So you might do 16 weeks on, six weeks off, you know, 16 weeks on, six weeks off, 16 weeks off. So that's something like that uh, for people, like I said, who are not planning on competing that particular year. But if you're if you're if you're going to say, hey, Dave, I want to compete in the fall and we're starting January 1st, more than likely you're going to go from off season into contest prep. And then then I'm going to clean you out at the end of the year. And that's usually with for most competitors what they're doing on a regular basis. Now, some people never go off, you know, and that's not good because it catches up to you. Your body looks stale. You don't make improvements and, and you kind of stagnate your your, your gains. Uh, so, you know, I've always and it was only like I, I told you this story a million times. There was one year I did not go off from from 96 to seven. I stayed on because I was I was filming a training video, my training video. And I didn't want to I, I wanted to be big. And it was the biggest mistake. I, I looked for all my shows. I looked okay. I just, I just was like stagnant a little bit. Or I think it was from '97 to '98 that that years, those years. And I just, I look at the pictures. I'm like, you know what? I, I didn't look right. You know, I just didn't have the snap to my body. I didn't really make the improvements I had made the years before that. So after that, I always cleaned out after every show. Let's go to uh, Bilal Hamide. No, I've been told that running Mastron will put on more muscle than Deca because it's more androgenic. Is there any truth to this? I don't agree with that at all. Um, I think Decker is much more anabolic than um, Masteron. You know, I think Masteron has less side effects than Decker. Doesn't raise prolactin levels. Uh, it seems to be less 
fluid retention from it. You have a drier look. That's why a lot of people save master on usually for contest prep. But I, I, I totally think DECA is – I think DECA equipoise are probably the two most powerful uh, injectables with the least side effects, you know, long-acting injectables with least side effects. I think under right under that, you probably have like Masteron um, would be under there. Well, you know, Trembolone is very strong, but it's got more side effects. So, but I mean, Trembolone is probably the strongest non-testosterone anabolic. So you put Trembolone, you know, EQ and um, DECA together, and then everything else is right underneath that, you know, Winstrel, Masteron, and uh, and then under that Prima Bowl and, and Anivar type in that, uh, as far as injectables go. But, you know, some people like Masterongs, they don't get side effects from it, as many side effects, but I don't think you're gonna grow as better as well as when you do on DECA. Now, some guys can't take DECA because it kills their sex drive and it's just not worth it for them. And that's, I understand that. No one wants to have, <laughs> no one wants to have a problem getting an erection, you know? Uh, I know guys that look at DECA and it happens to them. I know other guys that use tons of DECA and they have no problems with it. So it's kind of a, a personalized thing. Question regarding something that, unfortunately, you are familiar with. It's from Harley Ryder. What supplements would you recommend to rec to help heal a quadricep rupture on 12 weeks post-op? Yeah, I kind of put out uh, my, my uh, injury healing protocol. You know, I, I like to use GH if you can use it. Uh, two I use a day, a little, you know, a little TRT is usually good too, because that, that helps the muscle recover faster. Uh, you know, even a little DECA might not be a bad idea. If you do hundred milligrams of DECA, hundred milligrams of testosterone, um, especially you're at 12 weeks post recovery already. So I think you're fine to do that. Uh, a little BPC 157, right? That, uh, around that area, make sure you're very sterile. You don't want to put any infection into that area. 200 micrograms twice a day would be really good. You definitely want a lot of vitamin C. Vitamin C is one of the components of collagen connected tissue that's going to help that tendon heal. 3,000 milligrams per day minimum. I would use my Arthrolyze formula that has very high glucosamine, MSM, boron, you know, in there that's going to help with the healing process as well. Five pills twice a day. And you want minerals too. You need minerals to mineralize that, you know, to help the healing of that area and vitamins. So I would use my V mineralized five pills twice a day. And I think if you do that, I think that you're kind of have all your bases covered as far as healing goes and then let the thing heal and do the therapy. The therapy is the hardest part of a quad tear. He's probably at the point right now, this guy where he's having to try to bend that thing. And that's very, 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 very painful. <laughs> uh, anyone who's gone through it knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's not a fun process, uh, but you have to do it. If you don't push through that pain, you're going to wind up with a very limited range of motion in your knee and you're not going to be able to bend it beyond 90 degrees and you're going to be very unhappy. So it, it is unfortunately probably one of the most difficult muscle tears to recover from of, of all of them. And I don't think anyone would, would, would basically uh, debate that if they've gone through it. It's brutal. It's very, very, very painful. Uh, let's go to this question about headaches and um... – where did I just lose it? All right, here we go. Uh, best treatment for chronic headaches and migraines. You know, I'm not, I've never had like a migraines or anything like that. And I, I, you know, I know people who do, and a lot of times people tell me caffeine works really well for that. In fact, there's actually some prescription versions of that that have caffeine in it because the caffeine constricts the blood vessels in your brain, which will sometimes, you know, quell the headache. Because if you think about it, what does clenbuterol do? One of the side effects of clenbuterol is headaches. Because clenbuterol is a dilator. If you dilate too much in your brain, the blood vessels, it, it can cause a headache. Caffeine constricts the vessels. So caffeine a lot of times will, will fix a headache along with maybe two Tylenol. <laughs> I don't use if, – if you notice, I never recommend ibuprofen or any kind of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory because they do inhibit muscle growth. So when in, when in doubt or if you can avoid them, I always recommend like Tylenol because Tylenol doesn't in, in, inhibit inflammation. In the body so it's not going to uh, it's a pain reliever but it doesn't inhibit inflammation which is good for bodybuilding now if you have a severe like tendonitis and you're using ibuprofen as an anti-inflammatory you're going to have to use 2400 milligrams of that per day for like two or but that's only for like two or three days um but if you get a migraine i would try like i said drink a cup of coffee you know take something with a little caffeine in it you don't want to take it in the dilates you want something that constricts and then obviously you know two tylenol usually helps a lot I, I don't get, uh, like I said, migraines, so I don't know all the little secrets that I know a lot of people have a lot of different little uh, medications that they take uh, to deal with that. But 
uh, I understand it can be a, a, a real pain in the neck. And uh, when you get one of those headaches, you don't want to do anything because I know someone who has them. And but they do tell me caffeine does hurt, uh, does help rather, and uh, as well as Tylenol. Um, we'll take one more question. Uh, any med, another med sub peptide question? Any medic, any med subs or peptides for chronic Lyme and fibromyalgia? Like Lyme disease? Is that what they said? Yeah, Lyme disease. Yeah. I, you know, fibromyalgia is, is 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 brutal. I have a friend, my friend Janet Marsco deals with that, and it's uh, it's not fun. It's uh, a lot of pain and you know discomfort. I think they use a lot of gabapentin for that, you know, which is to try to numb the nerves and things. I I really don't know what 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 can be used for that. I think that anabolics like testosterone will help a little bit. I think the growth hormone supposedly helps, but at the end of the day, when you get one of the flare ups, it's you know a lot of times they, they're going to put you on some kind of like prednisone or put you on some kind of anti inflammatory, you know, severe anti inflammatory because the pain is just too much. And I, I really feel for people who have fibromyalgia. It's, it's not fun. And I know that some of the side effects of, of Lyme disease that was maybe undiagnosed and then the person's dealing with chronic, you know, flare ups of it is not fun as well. And to be, I don't want to, you know, talk out my butthole because I don't have that and I don't really know anyone who really deals with that regularly. So it's hard for me to give you uh, specific like supplement advice that might help with that. But obviously anything that's anti-inflammatory like cucurmin would help probably. Obviously, taking omega lives, which has a lot of you know fish oil in there, is an anti-inflammatory type supplement. Trying to eat an anti-inflammatory diet, less red meat, you know, more greens uh, was, is going to definitely help as well. Make sure you eat a lot of fish because uh, those are anti-inflammatory. You want to stay away from anything that has a lot of arachidonic acid, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, which that would be from chicken breast and you know, red meat and stuff like that. Try to eat more, like I said, more fish, eggs. Uh, whey protein stuff like that to get your you know to get your protein source in, and that should help. But unfortunately, it's one of these things that just it's an autoimmune disease. It's your immune system messing with your body, and you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. And hopefully, if you can eat an anti-inflammatory diet and take an anti-inflammatory supplements, you could have more good days than bad days. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Right now on the channel, all new episode of After Hours yesterday, uh, all new episode of The Confessional, and of course, all new episode of Sunday Night's Heavy Muscle Radio. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our shows, upcoming segments, or anything that we have on this channel. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below. And as always, we appreciate all of your support. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.